population biology, we're going to talk about plants, animals, humans. Okay, we're an animal, but we're going to talk about how these organisms grow as a group. So we're going to be focusing on, like I said, population. So a population is a group of a specific species. So you'll see in these graphs, we're going to be following just one species at a time. You might be have more than one species, but they'll be graphed individually. Because when we look at populations and compare populations, we're going to compare them as individual groups. So we're going to look at two growth models. We're going to look at exponential growth and we're going to look at logistic growth. So we're going to look first at exponential growth. So exponential growth is what we're seeing here in the graph. So what you're looking at is growth of generations of cockroaches. And we're going to start with a very small number of cockroaches at generation zero. So, you know, just a handful of individuals. And this is numbers in the thousands. OK, so 5,000, 10,000, 15,000. So we're just going to start with a handful of individuals comparatively, so a couple hundred. And then go forward through the time steps, through generations, basically. And you can see that very quickly we go from, you know, generation or time one time to time zero to time one. Doesn't look like there's much of a change. Time one to time two, time two to time three, time three to time four. So what happens? Obviously, the population increases very quickly in those last couple of time steps. So time zero to time two, there doesn't look like there's a big increase in population, but then in time two to time three, and then especially time three to time four, we get this big jump. And so this is what we call exponential growth. Uh, we designate exponential growth when we graph it it looks like a j curve so you can tell exponential growth from this j curve so my question is can this continue so can this kind of growth continue indefinitely and why or why not my guess is you probably said no and yeah, this kind of growth can't continually and continue on indefinitely. And that's because they're going to run out of space or food or, you know, water, whatever it might be. And so this is going to be what we call a carrying capacity. A carrying capacity is the maximum population that an area can, well, carry uh, because of, you know, supplies, space, whatever it might be. So eventually, if an organism goes into exponential growth, they're going to hit that carrying capacity and the population is going to crash, right? So we see this sort of exponential growth happening in organisms all the time. So things like insects, especially when they move into a new place. So this is why, for example, you may only have a few insects in your house, like cockroaches or other insects, like fruit flies. And then the next day, it seems like there are just thousands of them. Well, that's literally what happened. Um, same thing with mice. Um, you might only have one or two mice. And then next day, it seems like there's hundreds of them. Well, they underwent exponential growth, but eventually their population will crash. So let's take a look at an example of a population that's undergoing this exponential growth and then population crash. So this is data from an island up in um, Michigan. It's out in Lake Michigan. It's called Isle Royale. And what happened is the um, moose in that area at one point were able to get out to the island. So a small group of moose were able to get out there and start populating and just happened to be able to be studied by some scientists. And what they saw is a J curve. 
right? So the population went into exponential growth, but eventually what happened is they had a population crash. They died back. And this is because they exceeded their carrying capacity. So you can see here the carrying capacity. The carrying capacity here is the amount of food on the island. So eventually the moose population went over the amount of food, they ate the island bear, and the population died back. And each time this happens, they die back past the carrying capacity because they don't have any way to really tell, right? And then it happens again. They overshoot and then they die back and they overshoot and this continues on and on. So that's one thing that's going on. We get this cycle of what we call boom and bust. And this happens a lot in nature where the populations will overshoot their carrying capacity and then die back in response. But what I want you to take a look at on this graph is what else is happening. So we get these boom and bust cycles, but what happens to the carrying capacity over time? Because they actually were able to track this because the moose were really the only herbivores on the island. What you should be able to see is that, yeah, the carrying capacity decreases. So if I draw a line straight across, over time, the carrying capacity decreases from these boom and bust cycles because every time they boom, they do damage to the uh, flora on the island, the plants on the island, and they cut their carrying capacity back because they've eaten too many of those plants for the plants to be able to recover. Okay. What's interesting is eventually over time, some wolves actually made it to the island and the wolves actually helped with this because the wolves actually follow a different type of general growth and that is logistic growth. So logistic growth also follows a letter. Um, you can see we call this an S curve because it generally looks kind of like a flat S. And logistic growth works a little differently because as the population closes in on the carrying capacity, instead of overshooting it, what happens? And why is this happening? So yeah, the population, as it approaches carrying capacity, levels off, and it usually levels off right around the carrying capacity. It might go a little above, a little below, but it doesn't overshoot the carrying capacity. And why? That is because these guys that are usually following logistic growth are growing slower. They reproduce slower and so their population can ease up to the carrying capacity. Um, so they can not consciously, but on, you know, their population kind of unconsciously is adjusting to the carrying capacity so they don't exceed that carrying capacity. And so these wolf populations actually were able, because they have this logistic growth, to come in to the island and actually smooth out some of those boom and bust cycles of the moose and both of their curves are following pretty much a logistic growth curve at this point. All right, so what can affect things like the carrying capacity? Because carrying capacity isn't just the amount of food that is there. So let's take a look at some different factors. So the factors that can affect your carrying capacity fall into two groups, what we call density dependent versus density independent. So density dependent factors are gonna be things that are biotic or things that are related to the living organisms in the system. Um, so to give you an example, overcrowding, 
would be density dependent. So the more organisms you have, you have overcrowding issues and things that come along with that. So can you think of things that would be tied to biotic living organism problems that could change the carrying capacity, could reduce the amount of organisms that could live in an area. So other things that could come in there, and I'm sure you came up with things that are different than what I have on the list or along the same lines. So other things that could come on here would be things like disease. So that kind of goes along with overcrowding, right? So as you get more organisms in an area, disease spreads faster. Stress, so that's another one that's actually tied to overcrowding. The more organisms you have in an area, the more stress that they actually undertake, you know, and that can lead to things like increased disease and um, other conditions, and then predation, right? So just being eaten can cause problems as far as your um, carrying capacity and your population. So these are all density dependent uh, factors that can change your population and your carrying capacity. Density independent factors are abiotic factors. So these are the non-living factors that can affect your carrying capacity and population. So what are some things that would be non-living parts of the environment that could affect your, you know, population, your carrying capacity? So things like fire, drought, what other things can you think of that could affect your ability um, if you were an organism you know, living out and about as far as, you know, your ability to grow as a population and the maximum carrying capacity for your area. Okay. So let's take a look specifically at one of these um, density dependent interactions, which is actually an interspecific inter interaction which is between species, and this is the predation react, interaction. So we're looking at data from snowshoe hares and Canadian lynxes. So these little kitties right here. So snowshoe hares are just the um, bigger version of like our rabbits that we would have here in Ohio. And obviously they're white. Now what we're looking at here are pelt data. So these are from hunting. So it's not a direct measure of population, but if you look at the years, you know, this is a pretty good measure of population at the time. There weren't a lot of scientists up there trying to gather population data, but it's a pretty good correlation for population um, since, you know, the more of the animals that were around, the more pelts people would be able to hunt and collect. So what I want you to do is take a look at the graph and see if you can figure out what relationship these two populations have. So the blue line is the lynx, so the one that's lower, and the yellow line, which is generally the higher line, is the snowshoe hare. So what relationship do you see between these two populations over time from 1850 to 1930? And the general pattern that we see is probably what you have sort of described, is that you see a spike in the snowshoe hare population, and then a little after that, you get a spike in the Canadian lynx population. Now, it doesn't always exactly match, right? So right around here, we're off. Here, they overlap exactly. But most of the time, this is what we see, a spike in the snowshoe hare, followed by the lynx, and those spikes correlate with each other as far as size, right? So the higher the snowshoe hare spike, the higher the lynx spike goes. Um, so this is showing us that as there's more food, then 
a little bit later, you get more of these Canadian lynx because it takes them a little longer to reproduce and have a larger population. But then as the snowshoe hares die back, so do the lynx. It takes them a little bit more time sometimes, but their population dies back too. There's not as many of them around to hunt. So that makes sense. And not only that, the lynx population is always lower than the snowshoe hare. And that's what we always see um, because of what we saw and talked about back in the energy chapter, right? The lower you are on the food chain, the more energy you can get from the next part down. So, you know, you've got these guys, these guys are eating producers. So we've got, let's say, the grass that they're eating. So these have that 100%. These snowshoe hares would only be getting 10% and the lynx would only be getting 1% of the energy. And so their population is going to end up being much smaller overall. Okay, so I'm going to pick up in the next video talking about more things like reproductive stra strategies. Um, this is the end of kind of like the population interactions um, and so forth.